Good evening. 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 Former Dutch ambassador and former executive director of Cordaid and NIMD. We also have with us Dr. Robert. This was Dina, uh, the uh, uh, Global Council uh, Chair on Wellbeing. And we have uh, Mary Amy from uh, the, the Managing Director of Impact Based Finance from Societe Generale, who is also the uh, Global Council Chair on Finance. Dr. Robert, I have a few uh, uh, questions to you, actually. Uh, COVID-19 has had several implications on the well-being of communities worldwide. So has the pandemic been an awakener on how we can do better? I think it has been an awakening. A, a lot of people talk about there being a, a silver lining, but I think that that suggests that what we've experienced is a, a rain cloud. And I think something more seismic has happened. That is, I think we've endured an earthquake that has shaken global society. It's exposed some of our foundations, uh, particularly inequalities. And I think that we have an opportunity sort of post earthquake to look at how, what, where, and, and when to rebuild, that is to remake society. And I've been encouraged in seeing shifts, tectonic shifts in how we uh, approach old ways of doing things, the uptick in uh, telehealth service delivery, uh, the increase in telecommuting and uh, an increased recognition that People in some sectors can work effectively and, and productively from home. We've been asking fruitful questions about how we train and support policing, how we deliver education, and so forth. So I do view this as a real opportunity. Great. And if I, if I may ask you as well, uh, Dr. Robert, uh, what are the key priorities that you believe should be addressed in order to achieve the SEDs? And also, what, are, what key challenges will we face in the next few few years when, when it comes to well-being and what do you believe should be done? Well, in terms of key priorities, as a well-being researcher, you'll find it no great surprise that I think that well-being should be our priority. And I encourage policymakers to establish and adopt formal well-being frameworks, uh, to think about the measurement of these frameworks, and then ultimately to use these frameworks as an overarching lens by which to, to evaluate other policy priorities. I think when we put well-being front and center, we still get to focus on commerce and energy and the environment. But what we do is we we offer a framework for diverse ministries and departments to uh, coordinate and collaborate. In terms of challenges, I think that um, it's a, a psychological phenomenon. I think when people's livelihoods and health are threatened as they are now, uh, people ultimately adopt a scarcity mentality, and this leads to short-term thinking rather than long-term thinking. I think that's problematic for environmental and other reasons. And I think that when people have a scarcity mentality, they're less accepting and less collaborative of other people, especially those they view as different from themselves. So what we need to do is create an abundance mentality. And although there are challenges right now, we live in a time of unprecedented mental, social, and technical technological capital. So I'm, I'm encouraged by these things. Thank you, Doctor. If I may move to uh, Mary Amy, um, what, what are the new challenges in terms of financing the SDGs, seeing the level of the national debt increase, increasing uh, globally due to the uh, COVID-19? And what are the innovations possible in this respect? And did businesses do enough when it comes to financing SDGs? Thank you. Yeah, indeed, the, the challenges are, are huge. And, uh, and with the trillions that have been um, uh, invested to, uh, to, um, to react to the COVID crisis, uh, states have uh, no to uh, very, uh, are very little to, to no uh, flexibility in taking on new debt. Uh, so now it's really the time to do more with less, so less uh, public funding, but also less resources, less negative impacts. Um, 
so how do we do that? Well, we really need to have a systemic shift, um, as previously mentioned. Uh, so it means rethinking completely our business models uh, so that we focus on how businesses can achieve positive impact and, and better uh, mitigate uh, the negative impact of their activities. Uh, it means uh, taking a holistic approach and looking at all possible additional positive impact that can be provided by any services and, and or products provided by, by companies and by promoting uh, business models that are both profitable so that they are sustainable in an economic way, but also uh, sustainable uh, for the people and, and for the planet. So in fact, what we need to do now is quite uh, challenging, which is to, to bring, a, uh, bring on a, an impact-based economy, an impact-driven economy and uh, it looks a bit overwhelming but if we look at the covid crisis we're still in, in you know in the middle of facing we can notice that uh, uh, companies and citizens they have reacted quite uh, efficiently uh, at the crisis and and they've been quite agile and disruptive in finding solutions and rearranging the production lines uh, when driven by a common goal and often they've been more reactive in fact that governments that set themselves so uh, I, I strongly believe that if we are able to um, maintain this uh, disruptive mindset and maintain also this collaborative uh, mindset that has been um, um, that has emerged uh, to to fight the the crisis and keep that momentum, keep that mindset uh, for the recovery period, and to bring it uh, to fruition uh, by uh, uh, focusing on achieving the. Uh, the goals, the sustainable development goals, and by bringing on new business models that are impact driven, uh, uh, we have a chance, uh, a chance, an opportunity uh, to accelerate the, the pace of change uh, and uh, to bring the scale uh, of change that is now needed if we want to, uh, uh, to achieve the SDGs in the next decade. Uh, so it's really about keeping this momentum, uh, bringing a more disruption in, uh, in the businesses themselves, and what we can see uh, from, uh, you know, from uh, my day-to-day -day work, uh, working with companies and banks and investors, is that the private sector is really uh, ready uh, to take on this challenge. So it needs, it needs to be pushed a bit more. Uh, and I think um, initiatives like the, um, the SDG councils uh, are great ones, like any other uh, uh, coalitions and collaborative initiatives. Uh, to bring uh, uh, this uh, the, the, this forum and this disruptive mindset uh, uh, to engage with uh, all actors in the in the economic. Marianne, if you allow me also to ask you further, so what can the government really do, or how can it facilitate the the encouragement for the private sector to uh, be a part of the solution when it comes to financing the SDGs? Well, uh, obviously, uh, policies and, and leadership, and, uh, and Simon will, will speak uh, to this uh, much better than, than, than uh, I will. Uh, they are essential uh, to provide guidance, uh, for example, by putting, uh, uh, you know, minimum uh, thresholds uh, in order to uh, raise the bar as to how uh, companies and businesses uh, manage uh, the negative impacts related to their uh, activity uh, and also uh, to uh, raise the bar as to um, you know, the protection and the um, that is provided to uh, to their employees and the other stakeholders uh, as well as uh, uh, to of course the uh, the, the level of uh, uh, carbon emissions for example that are uh, that are derived from uh, from their activity uh, so we have seen that for example in Europe with the EU taxonomy that is uh, uh, aiming at doing this, at harmonizing and raising the bar in terms of, uh, of levels. Um, and then another way, um, which I strongly believe in, in uh, 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 of catalytic impact that the government can have, is in the way it is spending uh, uh, its budget. And, uh, and um, in particular, instead of, for example, uh, uh, giving subsidies, looking at uh, providing first-class uh, um, funding uh, to uh, uh, blended finance structures where private finance can be mobilized and uh, where uh, more, more um, funding, in fact, will be achieved 
uh, on the same amount of public money uh, that is made available. Thank you, Mary Amy. Ms. Simone, are you able to hear us now? I'm finally there. Yeah, thank you so much. And I could follow most uh, most of you, so, but it was really strange. But anyway, I'm there. Yeah. Great. So then, Mary Amy, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Simone, can you please tell us how can how can the partnership really happen between government, uh, businesses, and civil society when it comes to implementing the SDGs work uh, going forward towards the year 2030? Okay, thank you so much. Well, a, a lot has already been said this afternoon about partnerships and basically everything related to leadership positions of those partners in those partnerships. So I think it's, it's beyond any question that partnerships are crucial to achieve the SDGs. We have to, to really look into this because the SDGs are not going into the right direction. Many of them are lagging behind and some are in reverse, despite the fantastic initiatives taking place all over the world, innovations, responsibility of uh, private sector, uh, NGOs, and certain also a number of governments taking the lead. But in many cases, it doesn't happen. And COVID has laid bare some really crucial systemic uh, weaknesses in uh, systems all over the world, in countries, that are leading to an enormous increase in poverty, hunger, exclusion, further inequalities in this world. And it's contrary to the goals and objectives of the SDGs. So if I look at um, the issue that uh, Maria May just uh, mentioned, which is about financing for development, we see that there was a gap um, of 75 trillion US dollars between the 90 trillion needed and the 15 supplied by uh, institutional donors. That gap is not going to be filled unless there will be an enabling environment for institutional uh, investors to invest. As somebody before, I think in panel one or two said that investable opportunities and projects are needed and there are not enough of them. So there is not so in those countries who need it the most, less uh, the least of funding is available. And why is that? Because those funders need an enabling environment um, in which they have a return on their investment and in which their investments are safe. And that means a properly functioning rule of law, security, well-functioning institutions, proper uh, um, taxa taxation system, regulatory frameworks, etc. And also inclusive and uh, socio-economic policies. And there's a, a huge gap between what is needed and what is being done. And why is that gap there? Not because all leaders of countries uh, don't want to do the right thing, because they have all committed to do the right thing. But um, I, I spoke to a number of government leaders and, and, and they confirmed basically what, what I saw myself in, with my experience, and that is that in countries with low institutional capacities, government ministers often lack the support they need to do their jobs well. Leading a ministry in such a complex time in a country with low capacities is a hell of a job. It's a huge responsibility and a huge challenge. And ministers need support. And that support is not coming. So there's a lot of, if you look at the language in, this, in, in, in all our circles where people are talking, they say, uh, countries should do this, this should be done, that must be done, we need to do this, we have to do this. But it's humans who are at the core of this issue. It is ministers and governments at all levels driving and leading for change. It's about systemic change and that is really hard to achieve. So that's why I um, uh, established this Leadership for SDGs initiatives, which I'm proud to say is part of the Global Council on SDG 16, led by Helen Clark, who, by the way, was at the base of the SDGs establishment as such. And uh, I just want to ask a question. Why is it that all CEOs and boards of companies are being trained and coached and supported? And everybody thinks that this is a fantastic idea and crucial for their performance. And nobody takes care of governments. So governments basically 
are left to their own devices. And that's what I want to change with leadership for SDGs. And um, I, I would also like to hear Maria May's um, view on, on, on this, how she looks at this, because all the issues that have been talked about today, all the different SDGs, whether it's well-being or health or education or clean energy or uh, uh, climate measures, we need proper governance. We need proper policies. We need policy coherence. We need implementation of those policies. And we need things to be done. That's the basics. And the basics are not enough being taken care of. So, so that would my, be my contribution for now. And I would, of course, be really happy to uh, engage in further discussion, discussion. And for me, it's 5 to 12. Uh, and it's interesting. When I was in Dubai last year, I saw on some wall in a government building, 2030 is now. And I agree with that. 2030 is now. We should have started building better leadership and governance 30 years ago, 50 years ago, but the future is now and we have to start building it. Thank you, Simon. I'd like to also hear about the initiative Leadership for SDGs, but I'd just like to move to Dr. Robert and I'm going to come back to you as well, Simon, on this one. So, um, uh, Dr. Robert, if I may ask you, when it comes to the well being of communities, how do you think uh, the governments in the region, if, we, if you can also speak about the government of the UAE, what role can they play to ensure that there are um, effective efforts when it comes to increasing the well-being of the communities here in the region? It's a difficult question to ask, especially because community development is going to be context specific and very region to region in terms of things like um, you know, bicycle commuting or things that we know could be helpful in one society won't directly transfer to another. But we know a great deal about how to design cities for uh, social support and social interaction, to minimize commute times, to find opportunities to put people in proximity to green spaces and put people in the public sphere where they can interact with one another, build trust in one another. And I think ultimately there's going to have to be public-private partnerships to do exactly that, where government is going to have to incentivize development uh, around the idea of creating a socially minded uh, city and, and then ultimately nation. Thank you, doctor. If I move to Mary Amy, uh, uh, Simone already asked you a question as well, but if I may, if I may add, add also to that, how do you think uh, the, the UAE, how can the UAE play a role or how can you describe its current role when it comes to a, a non-global challenge, which is financing the, the uh, SDGs. Well, I think uh, it goes with leadership and uh, leadership in uh, all um, areas where, uh, where uh, any country has, um, has uh, specific strengths uh, uh, and that it can share its knowledge uh, to, uh, with other countries on those specific uh, uh, sector. So uh, obviously uh, uh, the UE has shown a lot of leadership uh, in, in many different uh, aspects, whether it's sustainability or uh, uh, all the, you know, the, the different aspects of digitalization that can be applied uh, in, uh, in um, infrastructure. Uh, and all this, of course, is absolutely essential uh, to reduce costs and to improve transparency, to improve uh, efficiency. Uh, and uh, I think the UAE is already doing a great job at, at, uh, at sharing uh, this expertise, uh, in particular through the, um, uh, through the organization of, uh, of the World Governance Summit and this ongoing uh, work that is, uh, uh, that is done, as well as, of course, all the different actions uh, through uh, ODA and others to, uh, uh, to support uh, uh, in funding and in, in expertise uh, those projects uh, uh, where they are needed. Marami, if, if I may also ask you, um, would, can you share examples of where there were innovative solutions that our governments are from examples of the private sectors when it comes to uh, uh, financing the implementation of SDGs? Sure. So there are many uh, examples uh, which are all uh, 
umbrella of blended finance, uh, where uh, instead of giving uh, money to fund 100% of projects, uh, public funding is instead used as catalytic capital uh, to fund the first loss that enables uh, the uh, raising funding from um, uh, different private uh, uh, investors that have different uh, risk appetite. So essentially using public uh, funding or philanthropic funding to uh, de-risk uh, a project and therefore crowd in more uh, financing. And, and the leverage can be really enormous. Um, so this is really the key uh, going forward uh, to better uh, spend the public money uh, in addition to, of course, all the uh, work that needs to be done. And that's really what we're going to do uh, as part of the as part of finance uh, cluster in, in the council, uh, supporting the other um, uh, um, groups, SDGs, in their projects, like, for example, the Health in Your Health project, uh, with which we've worked uh, a lot with DG3 uh, and uh, precisely using the, the platform, that digital platform that has screened so many uh, high impact uh, healthcare initiatives for the first mile that are already profitable. So they are business that, uh, that can be uh, financed by the private sector, but uh, they need more funding to scale up and private sector needs some catalytical uh, funding to de-risk these opportunities. Uh, and so that's an example where we're going to be uh, mobilizing uh, uh, public funding, philanthropic funding, as, of course, as uh, a private funding from bank, uh, impact investors, uh, asset managers, and, and the like. Thank you, Mary. Back to you, Simon. Very briefly, can you please uh, shed more light on the Leadership for SDGs initiative? Well, I, I was triggered by the situation that I sketched, namely that in many countries, governments are basically left to their own devices. And they have huge tasks ahead, especially if you look at the implementation of the SDGs, which is not an easy, uh, uh, an easy undertaking, right? Um, and you have to move on many levels. It's about policy coherence. It's about getting your governance straight. It's about um, uh, uh, attracting funding for the uh, SDGs for the implementation. So it's a, it's a real big job. And so the idea is to support governments through personal leadership development, entire governments and ministers individually, uh, to help them become basically their best selves, both at an individual level and uh, as a group, uh, and both more on a technical level, uh, in terms of knowledge build up, uh, and through peer support. So that would be the idea. And I'm working with a few um, governments now uh, for as, as potential pilot countries. And of course, I hope to, um, uh, to continue to get the support of the UAE. I think the World Government Summit is all about governments and the leadership of governments. So that's really, really important. Because if that doesn't happen, if that doesn't change, if the preconditions for change for sustainable change, systemic change, have not been met. We can do whatever we want, and maybe le left and right things will improve, but we won't be able to lift the entire world population and see to it that all those inequalities and injustices um, are, are, are being taken care of. And of course, women leadership is, is, is a specific focus in, in leadership for SDGs. Thank you, Simone. Now I think we're very close to the end of the session, but I'd like to hear from all of you. Maybe I'll give 10 seconds for each one just to reflect on your journey or if you can tell us how do you feel about your journey while being with the Global Councils on SDGs. Can I start with Dr. Robert? This has been a particularly challenging year for me as it has, I think, for many people. And to be honest, hearing the uh, the other people involved with the SDGs and the global councils has been a bright light for me. It's been something that's encouraging just in knowing that there are other people who are committed to, to gender equality, to environmental uh, longevity and so forth. So I've, I've really, really been encouraged by it. Thank you, Doctor. Mary Amy? 
Uh, I'd say it's been a great uh, experience in terms of uh, uh, meeting uh, really uh, amazing people and, uh, uh, you know, a demonstration of how tenacity and being driven by a common goal uh, can, uh, can help achieve a lot and hopefully even uh, achieve more uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Last but not least, Ms. Simon, how do you reflect on your journey with the Global Councils? Well, I, I must say I've met amazing people, knowledgeable, committed, passionate, and I, I love passion personally, and I think that that is already a big treat. I seriously hope that the uh, Global Councils will continue to flourish and even strengthen. Um, and, and maybe last two words, I would say sharing is caring, and I think that this is what I can also see that we all try to do. Thank you so much for being here. So as we're coming now to the end of the session, it's been a pleasure to have you here, our distinguished panelists. Thank you for your great insights, your great contribution. And I personally look forward to uh, be always engaged with you in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being part of this session.